Welcome back to Rising. We are continuing with our post RNC night four coverage, and we are continuing to discuss the Trump speech that just took place I'm here with Jessica Burbank. And we're joined by Amber Duke, who is actually there at the convention in Milwaukee. Thanks for waiting up for us, Amber. We appreciate it. Of course. Well, you you all are actually an hour ahead of me, so really, I should be thanking you. I, yeah, I guess so. Well, we are tired. Um, what? Tell us. You know, the mood. I'm sure was very. I, I could tell it was very quiet while Trump was describing for the first time. You know, breaking his silence on the details of the the shooting. And I mean, I was glued to my screen. I'm sure everyone watching was. Um, and then it kind of got into more of his usual thing. And I saw some people start to check their phones and go, how much this is the longest speech I've ever heard in my life. But uh, give us your uh, your reaction. Yeah, it was really interesting because most of the convention uh, today was really rowdy. We had Tucker Carlson, who received, I think, arguably the biggest applause uh, after Trump of the entire convention. Hulk Hogan ripping his shirt off. We had Dana White from UFC introducing Trump. Kid Rock, uh, you know, changing some of the lyrics to one of his songs to uh, to su support Trump. I mean, people were basically partying in the convention center. And then Trump comes out and he promises to retell the story of the assassination attempt. Although he said it was the only time that we would ever hear him do it because it was too painful for him to tell. And it was gripping. It was moving. I saw people crying. Uh, but there was also laughter. He was cracking jokes a little bit throughout his retelling of what happened. Um, but I thought, you know, it was politically obviously brilliant. But even just from a human perspective, I think it was important for the country to hear from him and, and what exactly happened and, and just feel a little bit inspired, I think, by what he went through. But he didn't even talk so much about himself. He talked actually more about the Secret Service response, um, which has been criticized by some conservatives. But he praised the people who jumped on him as he was in the line of fire. He talked about the individual who lost his life and then the other supporters who were injured uh, from the would-be assassin's bullets. And he talked about the crowd response and how he was really proud of them because they stayed so calm throughout what was happening and didn't stampede which he said saved a lot of lives. Um, so I think it was really pitch perfect that first 20 minutes. I found it very interesting. We got some insight into what Trump's policymaking looks like. He spoke about his plan to take away taxes on tips for service workers like bartenders and waitresses. And he was speaking with a waitress who complained about taxes being taken out of her paycheck. And that's where he came up with the policy and that he saved a lot of money. A lot of D.C. politicians pay consultants to do all of this means testing research and come up with their policies. I think it's good to talk to working class people. But I think we also watched a new policy get made on the fly. And I have ADHD. I, I might say Trump is potentially our first ADHD president, because this is how it went. He said uh, that he, if he were in office, Hamas would have never invaded Israel, would have never started a war in the Middle East, is how he put it. He talked about how we need to bring our hostages back. And then he went on to say we need an Iron Dome here in the United States, which is interesting because I do believe our borders and skies are surveilled quite heavily. I think we have the equivalent of an Iron Dome or maybe even a more sophisticated version. But he brought it up time and again throughout the more rambling portion towards the end of his speech. I thought it was fascinating to hear him say that over and over. I guess we're getting an Iron Dome if he becomes president. Mm. Yeah, it was... Um the, the policy part, I mean, it was the policy part was a lot of it was textbook Trump. Some of it was, I think, come up with on the fly. It seemed to me he was going off the prompter a lot, um, maybe, you know, displaying his ability to do that much better than his rival, Joe Biden, who we don't even know for sure is still going to be in the race come Monday from all the reporting we're seeing. It's looking maybe increasingly like not, although I'm still a little bit skeptical and you know these kind of media people that say biden is going to be out any minute have been wrong so many times in the past i think we have to take that with a grain of salt um i too thought the tucker carlson speech was probably the 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 best delivered actually probably overall speech of the entire um convention and then i i did find it interesting kid rock um hulk hogan uh, dana white getting the penultimate speaking slot sort of or maybe was it was or one of third to last, something like that. Um, it, it speaks to a kind of 
what has been described as like bar stool conservatives or a, 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 you know a, a, an archetype of now younger more dude leading people who had voted democrat before and are not necessarily socially conservative but like are against cancel culture and what the, the what now counts as like social or like culturally conservative values it seemed like a lot of this was geared toward them maybe that's been identified as a kind of voter you could he, the, the trump campaign really wants to pick up in Rust Belt states in the Midwest. Um, you know what? What did you? Could could you get any insight into that from who you were talking to at the convention, Amber? Yeah. And first, I just want to mention that the Tucker speech. I agree, it was really well done. He was actually the only speaker, I believe, that did not use a teleprompter. Mm. He just had a timer up on the screen, and he just wow did all of that from I I don't know if from memory or just off the cuff. But yeah, it was pretty incredible. That's amazing. So <laughs> I know uh, he's a very gifted orator, obviously. But um, on on this point about the barstool conservatism and sort of the energy, I mean, you hear from people in here, it's like a vibe shift. The vibes are high. Um, it, there's a different kind of energy with the Republican Party. And I definitely think that's intentional. I mean, just going back to 2016, when Trump first announced he was bringing in all of these new voters who had previously voted Democrat and were part of the blue wall who then came over to him because they felt like he was speaking for working class Americans in a way that they had never really heard before from a politician. And what we saw tonight was described as, uh, by Chris Wallace on CNN as testosterone. <laughs> he was asked to describe it in one word and that was what he said. Um, but I, I do think it is keeping in, in line with that idea of the party shifting towards a more populist message. A lot of it is about just trying to energize and motivate people and listen to people and what they want to see. And people are sick of the stuffy, like consultant class, donor class, like BS that has ruled the two party system for so long. They just want to feel something a little bit more authentic. There were a couple points I want to ask you about what the response was like from the audience. We couldn't get the, the full picture unless they were pretty loud there in the audience. We could mostly hear Trump's voice. One was when he said, it's nice to have friends in reference to Kim Jong-un who have a lot of nuclear weapons. I want to know what the room's reaction to that was. And then also when he said, I want to buy your vote, or rather, I'm trying to buy your, your vote is the direct quote from him. I will be honest about that. And I promise to make Wisconsin great again. That's illegal yeah. to buy votes. Of course, he was probably joking, classic Trump. But how did people react? Yeah, he was definitely joking. Everyone in the audience laughed when he said both of those lines. There was a lot of laugh lines throughout the speech. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the length of it, and I agree that it was probably about 30 to 45 minutes too long. But I noticed something. You know, I've watched a lot of Trump speeches in my life, and um, one thing that I noticed is he was getting close to the end of the speech that was on the teleprompter that was prepared for him. He actually almost intentionally stopped himself and started telling stories, um, telling the story about going to rallies with, uh, with, with his dad to see Billy Graham at Yankee Stadium, and then went back to the teleprompter. It wasn't a normal sort of uh, can't help myself kind of riffing that we would see from Trump. And I genuinely got the sense that he was really grateful to be there and just sort of soaking up the moment and really enjoying it. And I think that's understandable given obviously what happened on Saturday. Well, we are grateful that you were there, Amber, and we will leave it there. Everybody can go to sleep or maybe get a drink. That's, uh, <laughs> and uh, Rising will be back tomorrow morning. Make sure you tune in. Thanks for watching. Bye, y'all.